My name is Dr. William Harkness, and the events I am about to recount have forever altered my perception of reality, thrusting me into an abyss of terror and madness. For years, I worked as a biochemist at the renowned Hartman Institute of Advanced Research, Pluff celebrated for groundbreaking scientific achievements. However, beneath its glossy surface lurked secrets so dark and horrifying that even the bravest would shudder to their core. The story begins on a cold November morning, when I received an urgent summons from Dr. Victor Klein, the Institute's director. Klein was a formidable figure, known for his relentless pursuit of scientific progress, often pushing the boundaries of ethical considerations. He was a man who believed that the ends justified the means, and his demeanor that day suggested something of grave importance. Dr. Harkness, he began, his voice a low, grave whisper. I need you to assist with a classified project. What you are about to witness must remain confidential. Do I have your word? I nodded, curiosity peaked and unaware of the horrors that awaited me. Klein led me down to the Institute's basement, a sprawling underground complex that few knew existed. The air grew colder as we descended and a sense of foreboding settled over me. At the heart of this labyrinthine basement was a secured door, guarded by two armed personnel. Klein input a series of codes, and the door slid open with a hiss. Inside, the lab was filled with advanced equipment and a team of scientists who appeared both exhausted and on edge. Klein introduced me to the project. An attempt to merge human and animal DNA to create a new form of life one that could potentially revolutionize medicine and biology. I was horrified. Ethical boundaries had been shattered. The line between man and beast was no longer sacred, yet the lure of scientific discovery and the implicit threat in Klein's eyes compelled me to stay. The first few weeks were filled with routine experiments, splicing genes and observing cellular behaviors. However, as time passed, the experiments grew increasingly grotesque. We began to work with live subjects, mostly animals, but occasionally, human volunteers lured by promises of financial rewards, or those with terminal illnesses desperate for a miracle cure. The first successful hybrid was a grotesque creature, a fusion of human and canine DNA. It had the body of a man but the head and instincts of a dog. Watching its struggle to comprehend its existence was heart-wrenching, and its eyes, filled with a mixture of human sorrow and animal confusion, haunted my dreams. As the experiments progressed, the hybrids became more complex and monstrous. One night, I was called into the lab to witness the culmination of our work. Subject 47. This creature was an amalgamation of various species human, feline, reptilian, and avian. It was a horror to behold, with scales, feathers, and patches of human skin intermingling grotesquely. The creature's initial docility was deceptive. Within days, it began to exhibit signs of extreme aggression. Attacking the staff and other test subjects, security measures were tightened, and the basement began to feel more like a high-security prison than a research facility. One particularly dreadful night, I was working late when I heard a commotion. Alarms blared, and the lights flickered ominously. Subject 47 had broken free. The creature moved with terrifying speed and intelligence, evading capture and causing havoc. I could hear its roars and the screams of my colleagues as I hid under my desk, paralyzed by fear. When the chaos subsided, the lab was a scene of carnage. Blood smeared the walls, and the lifeless bodies of my colleagues lay scattered like broken dolls. Klein, his face a mask of cold determination, ordered the surviving staff to hunt down the creature. The next few days were a blur of terror and paranoia. Subject 47 was loose within the Institute, and its predatory instincts made it a formidable foe. We barricaded ourselves in the lab, working around the clock to develop a means to neutralize it. 
Sleep deprived and haunted by the atrocities we had committed, we were shadows of our former selves. The breaking point came when I discovered Klein's true agenda. One evening, while rifling through his office for clues on how to stop the creature, I found a hidden compartment containing detailed plans and correspondence. Klein had been funded by a clandestine organization interested in weaponizing our research. The hybrids were never meant to cure diseases. They were intended to be biological weapons. My disgust turned to rage. I confronted Klein, but he dismissed my concerns with a wave of his hand, his eyes gleaming with fanaticism. Science is war, Harkness, he declared. We are the soldiers of progress and sacrifices must be made. Determined to end the madness, I devised a plan. Using the data we had gathered, I developed a viral agent designed to target and destroy the hybrid cells. It was a risky move with no guarantee of success, but it was our last hope. As I prepared to deploy the agent, Subject 47 attacked. The creature's eyes, filled with an unholy intelligence, locked onto mine. In that moment, I saw not a monster, but a tortured being, created by our hubris. With a surge of adrenaline, I managed to inject the viral agent into its bloodstream. The creature convulsed and let out a guttural scream that echoed through the halls. Slowly, it began to disintegrate, its body breaking down into a viscous sludge. The Institute was in ruins, and the surviving staff, including myself, were arrested and subjected to intense interrogation. The truth about our experiments was buried under layers of bureaucracy and secrecy. The Hartman Institute was shut down, and its records sealed, In the heart of the Siberian wilderness, where the biting cold seemed to freeze time itself, lay the reclusive Kasparov Institute of Advanced Biology. Founded in the early 21st century by the eccentric and brilliant Dr. Sergei Kasparov, the Institute was a beacon of cutting-edge research, promising breakthroughs that could revolutionize human health and longevity. Yet, beneath its sleek, modern exterior, the Institute hid secrets that were as dark as the surrounding forest. Dr. Kasparov, a man whose intellect was matched only by his ambition, had always been obsessed with the concept of biological immortality. His life's work revolved around the idea that aging and death were merely technical problems to be solved. Supported by an immense private fortune and a team of the world's best scientists, he delved into the uncharted territories of genetics cybernetics, and neurology. As the years passed, rumors began to swirl around the Institute. There were whispers of unethical experiments, of human trials conducted in secret, and of strange, almost inhuman creatures spotted in the forest at night. The local villagers, fiercely superstitious, began to avoid the area, leaving the Institute and its occupants in a bubble of eerie isolation. One crisp autumn morning, Dr. Elena Volkova, a young and promising geneticist, arrived at the Institute, fresh from her doctoral studies. Elena was thrilled to join such a prestigious establishment. She was welcomed warmly by Dr. Kasparov, who immediately assigned her to his most ambitious project, Project Chrysalis. Elena was given access to a vast underground laboratory filled with the hum of advanced machinery and the soft glow of bioluminescent plants that lined the walls. Her task was to assist in the development of a serum that could halt and potentially reverse the aging process. The data was promising, but there was something unsettling about the sheer volume of human samples available for study. She often wondered about their origins, but her questions were always met with vague answers or polite deflections. As weeks turned into months, Elena became increasingly disturbed by the nature of the experiments. She discovered that many of the test subjects were not just animals, but humans. Dr. Kasparov rationalized it by claiming that they were volunteers, willing to sacrifice for the greater good of humanity. Yet, the hollow eyes of the subjects told a different story. One night, while working late in the lab, 
Helena stumbled upon a hidden door behind a row of specimen jars. Her curiosity peaked, she pried it open, and descended a narrow staircase into the depths of the facility. What she found was beyond her worst nightmares. The room she entered was massive, filled with rows upon rows of transparent pods. Inside each pod floated a human being, suspended in a viscous, greenish liquid. Their bodies were emaciated, their skin pale and translucent. Tubes and wires protruded from their flesh, connecting them to a central console that pulsed with a sickly, rhythmic light. It was a grotesque parody of a garden, with human bodies replacing the plants. Yilina's stomach churned as she realized these were not volunteers but victims, abducted and experimented upon against their will. She recognized some faces from missing persons reports she had seen in the news. Her mind raced, trying to comprehend the scale of the horror before her. Before she could retreat, a cold, mechanical voice echoed through the chamber. Welcome, Dr. Volkova. I see you have discovered our sanctuary of progress. Dr. Kasparov stepped into the light, his face a mask of calm determination. These individuals are the true pioneers of our work. Their sacrifices will ensure the future of mankind. Yelena backed away, her heart pounding. This is monstrous, Dr. Kasparov. You can't play God with people's lives. He tilted his head, a sinister smile curling his lips. Science demands sacrifices, Elena. The quest for immortality is not for the faint of heart. You, of all people, should understand that. Realizing she had no choice, Elena turned and fled, her footsteps echoing through the cold, sterile corridors. She had to get out to expose the atrocities hidden within the Institute's walls. As she reached the main lab, alarms blared and heavy metal doors began to close sealing off her escape routes. They dragged her to the central chamber where Dr. Kasparov awaited, a syringe in hand. You leave me no choice, Elena. If you cannot support our mission, you will become part of it. He injected her with the serum, and within moments, she felt a cold numbness spreading through her veins. Darkness engulfed her vision as she lost consciousness. When Elena awoke, she was inside one of the pods her body immobilized by the viscous liquid. Through the glass, she saw Dr. Kasparov watching her, a look of triumph on his face. Welcome to the future, Dr. Volkova, he said, his voice muffled by the liquid. You will be our greatest experiment yet. Time lost meaning as Elena floated in her prison. She could feel her body changing, her cells regenerating at an unnatural rate. The serum was working, but at a terrible cost. Her humanity was slipping away, replaced by something else, something monstrous. Years passed, and the Institute remained shrouded in secrecy. The villagers continued to tell tales of strange lights and ghostly figures in the forest. Those who dared to investigate never returned. The world outside moved on, unaware of the horrors beneath the frozen ground. And in the depths of the Kasparov Institute, the silent symphony of twisted science played on, an eternal testament to the dark side of human ambition.